Hello everyone, I'm Barbara Ham Lee. It's a problem in our country and it's a problem here in Hampton Roads. According to 2016 figures, close to 150 gangs call Hampton Roads home. There are 14 national gangs operating in our area and numerous homegrown gangs that recruit children as young as eight to join their ranks. Up next on Another View, we'll hear one mother's story of gang life and her family and how she has turned her pain into a mission to keep other kids safe. And we'll talk with a gang expert on how we can keep our communities safe. Gang life, it's next on Another View, so stay tuned. Discussing today's topics from an African-American perspective, this is Another View. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Another View. I'm Barbara Ham Lee. Black gangster disciples, bloods, crips, four tray gangsters, Latin kings, MS-13, skinheads, and there are seven more national gangs operating right here in Hampton Roads. And we haven't even talked about the numerous homegrown gangs that are a part of every city in Hampton Roads and the rural areas too. So why do kids join gangs? Is it by choice or force? How do you know if your child is in a gang? And what do we do to stop the violence associated with gang life? Joining us to talk about this is Joan Russell Turner, a mother whose son got caught up in a gang. Joan, how are you? I'm great. How are you? Good. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank we appreciate you. it. And we welcome back to another view, Bobby Kipper, founder of the National Center for the Prevention of Community Violence and author of No Colors, 100 Ways to Stop Gangs from Taking Away Our Communities. Hey, Bobby. Hey, Barbara. <laughs> Thanks so for glad you're me. back. Thank, Thank you. you so much. So let me start by, I'm going to start with you, Bobby, before we hear Joan's story. What is a gang? Let's make sure we're all talking about the same thing. Well, a gang, in Virginia, a gang is defined as three or more who are existing for the same purpose. They can either have uh, show colors, some type of display that acknowledges that they are connected as a group. And normally it has to be a group that is committing criminal offenses within a community. So they're connected by, by some logo, by something that connects them together, and they're committing criminal activity within a community. That's the definition in Virginia, three or more of a gang. Okay, and so it, it, criminal activity is, is key. It is key. So, so yeah. it's not just three people who may be in a right. fraternity yeah. or a sorority right. or something like that. Right, guys hanging at the block that. just playing sure. music. It's not a gang. But if they're okay. committing crime, they could be constituted in a okay. gang. All right, so Joan, you know, I've been teasing and, and promoting the fact that, that you, your son, fell into gang life. Tell me about him as a little boy first. What was life like? Uh, Quantez was very happy. Quantez um, loved playing sports, football, basketball. Uh, T-ball was one of his favorites from growing up. Um, when Quantez, I just found out when he was 27, that when he was in the eighth grade, um, because he was the tallest and the biggest boy in his class the other boys two or three together would push him up against the wall in the hallway would push him up against um tables in the classroom and um that's when I asked him did he felt like he was being bullied because he never mentioned this to us ever before wow. and he said he just started thinking about that and he thought maybe that was a sign of bullying um, he never mentioned it to a to to any adult, a teacher, nor my mom or myself. Didn't tell anybody that was happening to him. No. So how old was he when he got into gangs? Have you been able to determine? Um, I believe it was. Um, he told me that he was asked in eighth grade, going into ninth grade, going into high school, if he would be a part of the Bloods. Mm. Um, Quante's favorite color was always blue, and when he turned twelve, all of a sudden he liked red. Wow. And he used to ask for Christmas and birthday presents. Could his shoes be red? Could he get a a hat red? Could he get a shirt red? Mm -hmm. And we would just buy red stuff because that was now his favorite color. And I didn't realize at the time. And it, it never was, connected for you that that might be not at a all. reason why? Not at all. Mm -hmm. No. And even even though you were working in a police department at the time. Yes, and, I and was. Around, yes. you know, the, that whole thing. Um, so did anything before he actually told you that he was in a gang, was the colors, was there anything else that, that made you go, hmm, 
What's what's happening here? Yes, Quantez, um, his actions and the way he started talking to me, the way his behavior changed, uh, um, the people that he grew up with were no longer his friends. There were others that he I didn't know and um, other people did not know that he started um, hanging out with and, and talking with. Um, there were conversations that he would have when he became an adult and would come and visit me. There were conversations on his cell phone that I did not understand, and he said that that was the gang language, mm-hmm. and I would not understand that language. Um, Can you give us an example? Um, I, I don't even know the words, words that he was using um, because I would ask him, what, what is that that you're saying? Mm-hmm. And he said, you wouldn't understand that. Um and so I know that he was involved in gangs. I know he was involved definitely in criminal activity. Mm-hmm. Um, Quantes had been incarcerated many times for criminal activity. Um, and every time he came out, he started hanging out with um, either the same group of people or a different set of people who did more bad things than the than first, first set. thing that he, that he yes. was in. And it was always criminal activity. Did he? So when he was going in and out, did he ever say to you you know mom i want to i want to get out of this or i want to i want to change my life around or anything never 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 so he was completely immersed he was he was he he lived to breathe um gang and drug and gun activity that Mm. was just what he what was cool to him and what was happening to your family through this um it broke my mom apart. My mom was really, Quantez was her favorite, I believe. Mm-hmm. And um, it really tore her apart. And when she passed away, Quantez was actually incarcerated. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't think that helped him out much mentally. Mm-hmm. Um, and he never really talked much uh, much about her death after he came out. Um, and my daughter and I just continued to try to talk with him and to him and he just wouldn't listen. He just wouldn't listen. And I would imagine that's, that was a bit of a financial burden, too. I mean, with bail and, and lawyers. and I never did that. Really? I never. I was not an enabler. No. So and made and his if bed, you can, he laid in it. Yes. If you cannot do the right thing in my house, you cannot stay in my house. Mm. If you can't try to find you a, a job and do the right thing or go to school, you can't stay there. Mm-hmm. And so I never was an enabler to, to Quantez. I never put bail up. I never went to visit him. I would write him. Mm-hmm. And I told him he could write me back. But I would not accept any phone calls. The phone calls were blocked. I, if you can't talk to me and treat me as a mother when you're out, yeah. then I cannot accept you calling me and loving me while you're, while in, you're in. But when you're out... I'm called all kinds of names, um, and um, so I just I wasn't an enabler, and I just didn't accept it. So two years ago, yes, something happened. Yes, can you tell us what happened? Yes, so on um, November 11, twenty fifteen, at nine o four p.m., I got a call from a friend of mine who told me that um, Quante's girlfriend was crying, and she couldn't get anything out of her. She was trying to get information from her family. She put the girlfriend on the phone, asked the girlfriend what is wrong. And she said, I got a phone call from one of Quante's boys who said they saw him get shot. He's unresponsive. And then they pulled off. And I said, where? She said, Newport News. I said, where? Newport News. She said, downtown, I believe 25th Street. So my husband, my daughter, and I drove over there, called Suffolk Police. They got Newport News Police dispatch to get police and firefighters to meet us in that area. Mm -hmm. And they looked for him for about two, two and a half hours. And um, they went behind people's homes and the yards and, I mean, many streets, and we couldn't find him. About Mm -hmm. 3 a.m., we came back home. And the following morning, I called Suffolk Police and made a missing persons report. Mm-hmm. Um, and the report was taken, and immediately an investigation began um, connecting both Suffolk and Newport News, working together on it. Mm-hmm. Um, and then on Saturday morning, um, his, 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 his other siblings, um, his brother and his sisters, um, decided they wanted to go over to Newport News along with other family members to look for him. Um, I was at a point where I just didn't want to do that. 
because I woke up that Saturday morning with this this motherly gut feeling that my baby's gone. Mm. I just woke up crying and screaming because I really felt you felt it. My baby's gone. But you've had no closure. No, we haven't found. Um, we don't know where he is. We don't know if he's deceased, if he's alive. Um, nobody is talking at all. The guys that he hung out with over in Newport News is not talking. People in Suffolk that may know are not sharing information. So the family is still in limbo. But with all of that, we know that God has kept us because we're trying to now do positive things in the midst of all of this. We did a, a community forum back in March where about 250 people did show up and had a lot of good questions of the panel that we had there on that day. Mm -hmm. um, and now we've started a Quantez Russell Scholarship Fund in his name for students who are graduating from high school from the three Suffolk Public High Schools in Suffolk, Virginia. Mm -hmm. um, they would have to write a 300-word essay on how to eradicate or stop youth, gun, mm -hmm. and gang violence. Mm -hmm. Um, and then we would have a committee of persons that would read those. those um, for scholarship. Yes, for, for scholarship, yes. So, Quantes was 30? He's th Yes, when, he was 30 when, then, when, and when now he he's 32. 32. 32 years old. And he was in the eighth grade the first time when he was first approached. Yes. That's a long time to be in, in that life. Yes. Um, wow. What a yes. powerful story. I mean, Quantes, at one point, um, he was in the 10th grade. And I was working at the police department, and I heard over the radio that they were bringing Quantes in from high school. Mm. And I was wondering why at 11 a.m. would they be bringing him mm. back in? Well, they had um, arrested him for being in the restroom for imitation crack cocaine. I didn't know there was such a <laughs> um, imitation. Charge. Wow! <laughs> and it was um, ivory soap that Quantez cut up into cubes and had in plastic baggies and was selling oh that in the restroom to young men in the restroom. Which could, wow. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you just think about that because if somebody's buying drugs and they think they're getting drugs and they're getting ivory soap, that, that could trigger even more of a exactly. problem. Exactly. My goodness. So, Bobby, uh, there's so many questions <laughs> right. that I have, and I'm just trying right. to figure out where to start. First of all, when Joan talked about how Quantez started asking for red, red shoes, red this, um, so forth, indication of the blood. Right. Um, what are some of the other signs that parents need to be paying attention to um, to recognize that perhaps their child might be getting involved in gangs. Well, the good thing about Joan's story, if there, if there could be any good thing, is the fact that she has the tall tale signs of, of what happens to kids when they join gangs. Yeah. Again, um, yeah. the respect level for their family, they isolate themselves away from their families. They could have, you could have known their friends all the way through school, but all of a sudden they're hanging with people that you don't know mm -hmm. and that you probably won't meet. Um, there could be things like body tattoos, piercings, uh, the way that they're starting to dress very similar. Uh, again, um, it it may be all red. It could be all blue if it's the Crips. I mean, it just depends, depends on, what on which gang it is. Which gang it is. But mm -hmm. a lot of it has to do with attitude and culture about people's attitudes and how they really shift and change. And it does change the personality to one of disrespect and disting just about everyone because their power and strength comes from the gang. So they feel like that they can change their attitude toward anyone who's not in the gang. And I've heard before, just in stories about gangs and so forth, that gang members said, well, this is family. I didn't have any family. But Quantes had family. I mean, he he was in, I mean, you told me he was in the Boy Scouts, right, yes. Joe? Yes, he was actually working toward his Eagle Scout. Um, and then he just told me, Mom, I'm not going anymore. Um, and we would argue about going to the meetings, and he just didn't want to go. I mean, there were times that it was time for us to go to a meeting, and Quantes would say he would be outside, and he wouldn't be outside. He would be somewhere else. Wow. Um, yeah, so I I truly agree with what Bobby's saying. And he did start getting these tattoos, and I was fussing about where did you get these tattoos from, I didn't take you to get these tattoos. You're not at eight, at the age to receive a tattoo. Um, and it was of different things on his hands and his arms that I didn't know about until he became missing. Mm -hmm. 
that I realized they were that of gang tattoos. Mm -hmm. 440-2665 or 1-800-940-2240. Has gang life affected your life? Um, Give us a call. Let's talk about it. Or are you concerned about whether or not gangs are in your area? 440-2665 440-2665 or 1-800-940-2240. So, Bobby, what happens, and this is really for both of you, um, if you know, but what happens mentally in terms of once someone, a gang approaches a kid, what are they saying to them? What are they doing to get them to turn from Eagle Scout, <laughs> you know, to to a gang? Well, A couple of things. First of all, gangs normally target the type of kid that they feel like that they can get to. Um, You know, no one, I always tell kids when we're talking to teens about gangs, no one joins the gang to be the leader. They look for followers. They look for those that they can pick up, maybe an esteem issue or things that are wrong that are not going quite right in a person's life. Now, in this situation, it could be the culture, the power of the street becomes even bigger Bigger than our institutions. And that's the issue that we have to face as a community. So there are, are, are things that they target certain kids that they know that those kids will be much stronger, that they need strength, they need inner strength. They're not getting it. They're not displaying it. And so that's a down and out situation where they can attract a kid that wants power, that wants to grow quickly without having to do the things that would be normal to grow. Mm-hmm. You said in um, No Colors, 100 mm-hmm. Ways to Stop Gangs from Taking Away Our Communities, that the gang problem is no longer a police problem. It is a national crisis and a sign of community dysfunction. In October 2011, the FBI released the 2011 National Gang Threat Assessment, Emerging Trends, which reported a 40% increase in U.S. gang membership in just the last two years. It's here now. It's lethal. It's an epidemic. Gangs are spreading to quiet suburbs, gated communities, small towns, everywhere. They're everywhere. That is correct. And we just uh, recently, within the last couple of days, the International Association of Chiefs of Police put out a bulletin with the spread of MS-13 to even in Virginia rural communities. Mm-hmm. So this is an epidemic. It's, it's truly a domestic epidemic that must be addressed. You know, when I was working for Prince George's County Police in, in uh, Maryland and um, back in the early 2000s, and MS-13 was really infiltrating, but it, but it was the Shenandoah Valley of Virginia. And um, and then they would come into the district and into Prince George's County. So what's the thing about rural? What What's the attraction? Living, living under the radar. Mm. When you have a bigger community, you have bigger city police departments that have more resources. Normally they have gang units or special investigations units that, that concentrate on street activity. When you go into a rural area with, you know, maybe a smaller sheriff's office, they they like to be under the radar to do what they want to do. At the same time, they want to take over those communities, which is easier to do with the lack of resources. So so let's take MS-13 as an example, which is a, a Latino gang, right? Right. Um, so when they come into a community, I mean, do they do they dispatch people to go to different communities to start up? How does it get started, well, I guess it, is what I'm asking. Well, MS-13 is, is actually an El Salvadorian gang. Oh, it's El Salvador. okay. But... Um, what they normally do is they try to thrive on communities to set up their their way of doing business. Uh, the drug trade, as we know it in the United States, is no longer just somebody coming in to sell drugs into a community. It's very organized, and it's organized through these gangs. And what these gangs want to do is they want to take over territory. Uh, they're very territorial, and they want to take over gangs, uh, want to take over the drug market and the criminal networking market, including child trafficking and other things that gangs are now involved in. It is. Oh. It, it runs the gamut. We, we simply think of gangs as being strictly, you know, which is violent crime, but it's drugs, it's, it's prostitution. If you name criminal behavior, it could be very organized within communities and gang driven. My goodness. Let's go to Troy in Portsmouth. Hi, Troy. Are you on the air? Oh, well, thank you, Ms. Waller, for taking my call. Uh-huh. Uh huh. The young lady that you're speaking with, uh, she's out of Suffolk. Mm-hmm. Uh, first, my my hat goes on to uh, goes off to her for continuing to do the work that she's trying to do. I'd like to be involved if I could. Uh, I'm a former Department of Juvenile Justice officer, worked with juveniles for a long time. I got my education about the gang uh, membership and gang activity from gang members, mm-hmm. and uh, 
last summer we did a little small forum for juvenile boys in Fort Smith, and I was doing it by myself. Uh, what I found is that I, I, I really like what the kids are saying, and uh, they do have a fear about what's going on around them. The peer pressure is heavy to be involved in the games. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, I'd like to lend uh, and be involved in some of what's going on positive in the area of suffer force with Chesapeake. Uh, the kids really don't have an outlet. Nobody really wants to listen to them. At least that's how they feel. Mm-hmm. But there's a few of us out here that really want to know what's on their mind, where they are, trying to show them the right way to go. Okay, you know what? I'm going to um, ask you to call uh, Bobby's organization, the National Center for the Prevention of Violence, uh, Community Violence, and we'll put the phone number up um, in just a moment. Uh, but to, that'll be a good place for you to start in terms of getting involved. Um, both Joan, Joan is involved, Bobby's involved, and, and in full disclosure, I'm a board member. So um, it is definitely something that we could use your help with, and we appreciate Absolutely. the phone call. But, but to respond to what he was saying about kids being afraid, I mean, when you talk to kids, Joan, now, because now, you're doing this work, what do you find? I do find a few that have come to me and told me that they have been asked to be a part of a gang. Quantez told me that he has actually beaten people to be a part of the gang set that he was a part of, whatever gang set that is, um, Bloods or whatever gang set he was a part of. But he also told me that he was trying to become... The I guess there's a ranking in, the in yes, within, within and the he group. was trying okay. to become the man, I guess, the, the uh, higher okay. one. Um, but Quantes did tell me that he would threaten people and tell them, you know, man, you're gonna be a part of this or else. And he has beaten people to actually mm-hmm. become a part of that gang set. Um, and so I'm just hoping that the kids will actually talk to an adult like I wish that he had done when he was 13, um, 12 and 13, if he had only come to me um, or his grandma or an adult in school um, and just or at church and just say, this is happening to me. I don't know how to handle this. But, you know, one of the things I guess that they do is to say, if you tell anybody, <laughs> you know, we're going to beat you up or we're going to kill you or whatever they tell, tell them. And I wonder, you know, how do we overcome, how do we get, 12 and 13 year olds to push through that and still come to an adult. I, I think a couple of things that we need to do. First of all, when we look at the growth of gangs in the United States and we look at the prevention that's going to either through schools or through our organizations to get the message to kids at that young age, that it's not the choice of lifestyle. Um, when you look at the schools and you look at our communities, there are very few prevention, direct prevention efforts to really address gang life. Um, these stories that we hear from Joan and other mothers, that's why they're so critical, because that's the words that they need to hear. But we think they need to hear it when they're in high school, but it may be too late. We need to get across the board prevention, gang prevention in our schools, and I believe it's got to start early. Mm-hmm. Even as, as early as elementary school? Absolutely. I would imagine. 440-2665 or 1-800-940-2240 are the numbers to call. Have you been at, around gangs? Have you seen gang activity in your neighborhoods? Give us a call and let's talk about it. One of the issues in, in my research that I've um, been doing on this is the whole idea of denial of communities saying, oh, we don't have a gang problem here. (laughs) You know, is that part of why it continues? It's a major problem. And, you know, let's face it, nobody sells real estate or or attracts businesses because they have a bad gang issue. So even from the economic leadership of communities, I mean, it's not a real, you don't want that Band-Aid on your community. So a lot of people will shift it and They'll call it by their names, but it, it, truly it is gangs. When you look at the, the age of the suspects and the age of the victims, mm-hmm. you know it's a connected you know, young adult gang situation. So, um, again, you don't win friends by standing up saying that, and that's probably not <laughs> going to happen by a lot of leadership. But there are yeah. truly gang issues in every community in this area. But at the same time, there are gang units in all of the police departments in our area, Most of the they? larger police departments do have specialized gang, gang units. But, again, it's got to be, you know, it's such a major problem that it's got to be department-driven. The whole department needs the intelligence to get out there. 
and really start, you know, making these apprehensions and, and getting getting to the bottom of it. If you're just joining us, we're talking about gang prevention with Joan Russell Turner, a mother turned activist after her son became involved with gang life, and Bobby Kipper, founder of the National Center for the Prevention of Community Violence and author of No Colors, 100 Ways to Stop Gangs from Taking Away Our Communities, 440-2665 or one 800 Nine four zero two two four zero. Uh, let's talk to Donald in Virginia Beach. Hi, Donald. You're on the air. Hello, uh, and I must say uh, thanks, uh, everyone. Thanks for taking my call. Mm-hmm. And I would like to say uh, to Miss Turner, God bless you and keep fighting. And Mr. Tipple, thank you very much. And also, Miss, thank you for the program. And yes, I have on my fence. I had some graffiti on there, and I found out by a policeman that it was gang related. Mm. So it is in our neighborhood. Mm-hmm. I have witnessed that, and uh, he explained, broke the the code down very well, and uh, and you hit it right on the uh, right on the nail right on the head about it's in the neighborhood. Yes, it is. It is. And and uh, has your neighborhood come together? Have you talked about ways to try to combat the gangs in the neighborhood? Well, uh, yes. Unfortunately, that's a yes and no. I with my next door neighbor, we talked about it, but other than that, that's about it. But I was shocked to find out what it meant. Uh, so I will say I failed in that part. Okay. And I do apologize, <laughs> but uh, I am aware of the situation. I don't have covers over my head anymore, over my eyes. Over your, uh, over your eyes anymore. Thanks so much, Donald, for the call. We really appreciate it. So what can a community do? Because I know another issue is, and you talked about it very eloquently, Joan, nobody will tell you right. what happened to Quantes. Right. Nobody's doing the snitch thing. Right. And that's a big problem, and that's it? And that's what Quantes called me because I worked for the police department. And he told me I was a snitch. Yeah. And that's why I think he would not share things with me because he hated police. Now, there's one thing he did tell me that made me feel better about being in the city of Suffolk, living and residing and working in the city of Suffolk. Quantez told me that there were certain officers who knew what he was up to. Mm. If he was around that. If he was around them or if he was in a restaurant and they walked in just to purchase lunch, he would walk out without even purchasing his lunch or without eating because he felt they were. Right. But he told me he would go somewhere else to another city to do what he needed to do. Wow. To get paid because he knew that Suffolk police was looking at him. And so I felt better knowing that I work in a city where they are proactively working toward trying to prevent, educate, and then, um, and of course, our office, the Suffolk Commonwealth Attorney's Office, will prosecute mm-hmm. any cases. So both the Suffolk Commonwealth Attorney's Office and the police department work hand in glove when it comes to the education, prevention, and prosecution, and prosecution. of gang violence. And yeah, one of the biggest issues that we face, though, Barbara, is the fact that everything that Joan is talking about is on the justice side of the fence. Right. Where we actually need, you know, a strategy, a community strategy that that helps really to build that positive support all the way through the community. Uh, we believe in, um, you know, we've worked gang reduction programs throughout you know, the country and mm-hmm. had some real success with building strategic plans for communities based on prevention, intervention, enforcement, and then reentry. What do we do with people that have been incarcerated, you know, with right. the lower crimes if we just let them go back to the street? The street's going to take care of them. And then we're, we're, re- we're just basically recycling ourselves. As a matter of fact, there was an article in the uh, Virginian Pilot recently about the issues in juvenile detention. Absolutely, I read And that. how the, the gangs, they were housing the gangs together, or they were housing the same gang members in one place, you know, and separating them from the other gangs. And, and they were saying that there was a new way to do it where you kind of make a mixture of one gang, another gang, and, and non-gang. And they kind of balance each other out. Right. And if there's a question why the gangs are in your community, when you look at your own detention facility, having such a major gang issue within a city, you know how powerful it is. Absolutely. George joins us from Yorktown. Hi, George. You're on the air. Hi. Hi. This is George. Yes. Yes. Hi. You're on the air. Oh, okay. I just wanted to make a statement. My daughter is incarcerated at Hampton Rose Regional Jail in Portsmouth. She said the gang activity there is so rampant, it's unreal. Mm. And why aren't we taking the effort to reform them while they're incarcerated, okay, and so we could send them back out into the community? Or, you know, I know that's a private jail over there, but they need to take effort to 
separate those people and break them up and stuff like that. And and she says there's no effort whatsoever. Okay, thanks uh, so much for the call, George, and I'll let Bobby respond. Ma- major problem. <laughs> That's a tremendous problem, George, and, and one that we've got to face as a nation. I mean, when these folks are incarcerated, they're incarcerated together. It, it, we're not doing ourselves any favor. When they come out of jail and they come out of local incarceration or even state incarceration, we have a real – there's no quality of life plan. Who's going to hire folks? Who's going to interview them? What do they do with their life at that particular point? Our society tends to want to throw away people because they made some mistakes. And we're not talking about violent criminal offenses. It could be drug-related offenses that they got into some early drug trafficking. But the problem is, as these people come out, they go back into their communities. What are they supposed to do? Well, and and that's like they said, you can go flip burgers for, you know, minimum wage Right. Or you can go sell a couple rocks and Back you know, there you drug, go. Drugs again, that's right. And it, <laughs> and it starts to graduate itself. We do have to come up with a reform of our, our justice system. It's got to work better. It's got to basically produce more. But and, and, and the justice system is one thing. But the whole idea of a community knowing that there is a gang problem or knowing something about a crime that a gang has done and refusing to talk. How do we get people to get past their fear? Because I, I assume it's retribution that they're worried about. Um, and I know there have been some horror stories of people. I remember even in Baltimore, uh, um, a mother who used to just report gang activity all the time and drug activity, and, and they blew up her house. Um, and so I can't say it's not real. But at the same time, if the community doesn't come together and start talking about this stuff, how are we going to change it? Ahead, I think it has to start with the leadership of a community. One of the things that we don't really talk about, about the issues of gangs, is its impact on economic development. Okay. Business leaders, people that are in positions of leadership, have to really go down into the communities and really make people aware that they're there for them. Mm-hmm. Our people that live in communities, many of them are held hostage within their own, whether it's a, a housing project or whatever, and you know some of the issues that, that they face daily. Sure. So we have to go to those people from outside in. I mean, churches, um, all of our institutions have got to graduate to the point where we now know that this is a problem. We want to be there for you. So what I wonder is, and I don't know what you think about this, Joan, but is would gang prevention turn the way that the opioid addiction did? So in other words, until it starts hitting suburbia, <laughs> you know, that no one is really going to pay that much attention to to making a change and making a difference. I believe that um, we can work on that just like we do on the opioid um, um, issue right now. I think that both are similar, um, different, but similar. Mm-hmm. Um, and I feel that as much attention that is put toward that needs to be put toward Gang prevention and okay. education as well. Our phone lines are lit up. Let's talk to Ray in Virginia Beach. Hi, Ray. You're on the air. Hi, thanks for taking my call. Uh-huh. Um, I just want to let you know that in, in one of the local cities, I was in the judicial system for a long time. And uh, during that time, there was this one detective that was always coming around saying, you got to watch. This was in the 90s. Got to watch this. Gangs are growing. Gangs are growing. This is, you know, and he, he would try to emphasize it to everybody, but nobody up above him would listen to him. Okay. <laughs> but during my time there, I, I, I listened to him and I could see what was happening. It, it goes back to the, the crime, even for the adults. It's the breakup of the family and lack of education. You hone in on those two things and you will cure at least half your problem. That's my opinion. Okay. Thank you, Ray, for the call. We appreciate that. Anybody want to respond? Well, it, obviously, the breakup of the family has brought about a lot of social issues and social change in America. So, But, you know, then what is family? Right. And that's where communities got to step up. That's where, our, again, our community institutions. And I, uh, I'm a firm believer that the faith-based community can get involved. We've seen that be very, very effective in communities where they actually start doing homework clubs. I mean, these children need people to put their arms around them. Sometimes moms and dads are not there. So the community does need to step up, and it makes them feel more important. And the gangs, uh, you know, local gangs, what's the difference in terms of what the, the national gang and the local gang? Is it structure that makes it different? Normally or, or a structure what? in, you know, whether it's drug trafficking or the criminal uh, networks that they're involved in, how, how much does that grow? Is it with there just locally uh, within the community? 
Um, they're also, you know, want to be people that want to look like gang members and act like gang members, but truly they're not connected to the national movement. The national movement is very sophisticated. What we also need to understand, Barbara, is that these folks have their own Facebook pages. They're online. I mean, they're computer network savvy. We're not talking about people. You know, we always think that gangs are just uneducated people that really don't know, you know, what's happening on third base. These people are bright. A lot of these young people are extremely bright. They're very talented and they're very creative. Uh, I know we wrote an article with a professor at William & Mary about, um, you know, the creativity of gangs. And we think because of sometimes the creativity that's been destroyed or taken out of even our communities, kids are seeking ways to be creative. And gangs are some of the most powerful creative forces right now that we have in the country, believe it or not. It's true. We need to change that. Ward joins us from Hampton. Hi, Ward. You're on the air. Hey, good morning. Thank you. Uh for your program. Thank you. One one of the questions that I have is, where can I go to get some essential research that talks about what are some of the things that cause gangs to form in the first place? Like the gentleman just mentioned that one of the things that causes is the breakup of families. And I can certainly understand that. Or are there things like debt? Does debt cause it? Are there other issues of an overreaching government that has enthused people to say, hey, you can depend on the government rather than yourself and or your family? Well, uh, are, I, there, are there those types of things? That, where, where do I find a good definition of body of work that people have done? Does Bobby's Tipper's book, uh, Tipper's book talk about some of this? Or where can I go to get more data. Okay, we'll, we'll answer your question, Ward. Thanks so much for the call. Bobby, he can get your book, huh? <laughs> <laughs> the book does talk about it. It does talk about, um, you know, why people would make that choice. Also, um, the U.S. Justice Department has done tremendous research, the Office of Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention. If you just go online to DOJ and, and type in, you know, gang research, there's a ton of research that's been done by, you know, professors and psychologists and, and social scientists all over the country as to why these choices are made. And, you know, one size does not fit all with this. We don't know why one child will, d- will go and another child will not. It, it, it could be family dynamics, it could be community dynamics, and it could be, as in, you know, Jones' case, everything was going the right direction, they felt like, but the street was more powerful. The language of the street is extremely powerful, these people. And I do want to make sure that people understand that this is not a um, a racial problem. It, this crosses all races, all ethnicities, people, I mean, people who decide to get into gangs. Absolutely. You mentioned it earlier about the, gr- the growth and, and the presence of Latino gangs in the United States. Again, El Salvadorian gangs with MS-13. It, skinheads. It, skinheads, yes, exactly. White supremacists. Mm-hmm. I mean, those are still gangs. Uh, by any stretch of the imagination, you can try to call them something different, but they are gangs because they commit crime, and it's terrorist-related crime. Mm-hmm. So, Joan, if, you, to, if you're talking to a mother, I'm hoping other mothers out there are listening who, whose children either could be, you know, they're noticing things or they're, they're, or they're already involved, what would you say to them? I would say to them to try to talk with them one-on-one, um, listen. Just listen to them, let them just release themselves. Um, and then to try to get them into some positive things in the community, whether it's um, um, art, music, sports, um, and definitely faith-based group. Because there's a lot of faith-based um, groups that have um, – children and teen activities within the church Mm -hmm. that they can actually participate in and be involved in that is positive for them. Um, So you got to get that conversation, the positive conversation to be louder than the street conversation. Yes, definitely. So if you're in a gang, can you get out, Bobby? Well, I believe so. Absolutely. As a matter of fact, um, we did a program in Richmond called the Richmond Grip Program, the Gang Reduction and Intervention Project. Mm -hmm. And we actually had, we actually removed tattoos from gang members so they could come out and start regular working. Uh, oh, we actually wow. placed former gang members into jobs in, in Richmond. And again, the faith-based community was really involved in that. They just embrace these folks that really wanted to change their life. And if a, a young person is in gangs and they really want a life change, 
we can find connections in the community to help that. Do you have to relocate them though? I mean, how do you how do they get away from the gang? <laughs> well, it'd be very difficult if they're still in the same neighborhood. Yeah, uh, yeah. and it depends on the size of the community you're talking about. In a smaller community, it'd be very very difficult. But some of our larger communities, and and there have been gang members that have been moved, especially the more serious of uh, you know violent offenders that have gotten out. Uh, because they they run a risk that they're not going to be here. That they won't be here. Let's talk to Deborah in Chesapeake. Hi, Deborah. You're on the air. Hi, Barbara. Nice to talk with you. I listen to you all the time. I love you as well, sweetie. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. Look, I am originally from um, from Oakland, California, and I, I grew up there, and I've seen it. I knew friends that were in gangs, and the main reason is because a lot of the gangs that come from you know the poor areas and the 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 people that you know in the high ranking of the gangs, if you will, that they offer them money and you know all the stuff that they don't have in their lives, and then they get caught up, you know. And I know a few of them wanted to get out, but they got so caught up in it, you know, because it was missing that, you know, from home. Whether it be car, you know, they promised them cars and money and clothes and things like that 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 they were missing or didn't have in their lives, and then they're, they're stuck. Mm. Okay. Stuck. Yeah, that it, that is a problem. Deborah, thanks so much for the call. Let me get Bobby and Joan to respond. Well, to yeah, I think mm-hmm. it's true. You know, one of the things that we have to do is we have to really focus on the quality of life of our communities. And when the quality of life is not there, when communities are besieged by gun violence, when we're not paying attention to even the lighting of the communities and, and the communities has gone down, there's no education opportunities, schools are failing, all of those things point to a community in dysfunction. That's why in the book, that's why we described it as that. It's easy for communities to be in dysfunction to not be successful for people to go the other direction, to join gangs where they can get power, they can get a power base. Do you think elementary school is too, too soon no. to talk to gangs? No. I, I think uh, fourth and fifth graders will probably understand if if people talk to them. Mm-hmm. Um, since Quantez was 12, yeah. um, I believe, and in, and in, 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 I'm quite sure it probably came to him earlier than that. He just didn't tell me. Mm -hmm. So if you're 10, you're probably in the fifth grade, possibly. Um, So I would think fourth and fifth graders would possibly understand without, you know, without getting into deep detail. Mm -hmm. But I believe that they they probably have seen or heard something in their community or seen things on TV that that they would be able to understand. And how much does media glorifying gang life you know, I've heard kids say, oh, that's cool, you know, <laughs> and, yeah, and well, so forth. It definitely does. I mean, you know, the, the gang culture, the, you know, people really focus on gang membership or gang activity. We have a, another major problem in our society with gang culture. I mean, the look, the wear, the clothes. I mean, everything is almost like, you know, it's aggressive. It's in your face. It's disrespectful. It's disting one another. That's really the power of gang culture. And it has an impact even economically in our country. Okay, people are calling. They want to know the name of the book. The name of the book is No Colors, 100 Ways to Stop Gangs from Taking Away Our Communities. The authors are Bobby Kipper and Bud Ramey. Again, No Colors, 100 Ways to Stop Gangs from Taking Away Our Communities. Bobby Kipper and Bud Ramey are the authors of the book. And Bobby, tell us where, how people can reach the uh the center. They um, they can reach the center by actually they can go to solveviolence.com and there's all of our contact information uh, there about how to reach out to us. We have a, a, a form they can fill out about if they want to volunteer, if they want to donate. Uh, we are a 501c3 public charity and we look for people to be involved in our process and we're, we always have open arms because we need an army to, to address this. Mm-hmm. Joan, when Quantez's birthday comes or when we're getting ready to go into the holidays, are you okay? Yeah, it's pretty sad um, not knowing where he is. It's just sad every night I go to bed in my warm bed. But where is my baby? Mm. Um, last Saturday was two years, um, November 11th, and the family got together. And that's what Quante's always wanted was family. He loved family. Um, and he wanted, um, I'm, I'm, I'm quite sure he would have been very happy to see us come together. Um, yeah. on last last week. But yes, um, birthdays and holidays are very, very, they can be difficult. Um, I've had good days and bad days. Yeah. Um, majority of them have been good because I've had people to continue to encourage me 
um, and pray for me mm-hmm. and just give me some some thumbs up you know, to just keep me going. Well, the the whole idea of you reaching out to the community and working with people in the community and with children in particular to try to change and make a difference, that's what it takes Yes, yes. for for all of our communities. We need more Jones. (laughs) (laughs) And I I really enjoy talking to the kids. So if there's anybody in Hampton Roads who would like for me to come out and do a speaking engagement at at church, faith-based groups, or um, they can... um, Call me mm-hmm. at 757-650-8096. Okay. All righty. We are out of time. Can okay. you believe it? <laughs> <laughs> Joan Russell Turner, and her number is 757-650-8096. We will put it on our website. If you'd like her to come out to speak with your group about gangs, Joan, thank you so very much for thank sharing you. your story. We really appreciate it. And Bobby Kipper, author of No Colors, 100 Ways to Stop Gangs from Taking Away Our Communities. Go to solveviolence.com, and there you will find information, um, all that you need to to know about stopping violence in our communities and thank you thank you so Barbara. much again for, for joining us we really appreciate it and we will be right back hello this is spike lee what's happening and you listen to another view And welcome back. When you hear that a person has received more than 60 honorary degrees, it's usually a pretty good indication that they're a force to be reckoned with. Well, Dr. Janetta Cole is no exception. She's an anthropologist and author who has served as president at both my alma mater, Bennett College, as well as Spelman College. She is also the former director of the Smithsonian National Museum of African Art. Dr. Cole gave an outstanding fireside chat last night at Old Dominion University, which I had the pleasure of attending. But prior to her visit, she shared a little of her knowledge and insight on unconscious bias and race relations with our Lisa godly we all have biases if you're human you've got one but when these biases are not acknowledged and mitigated against they hook up with systemic racism and sexism and islamophobia to create the perpetuation of what we have seen for years Dr. Janetta Cole is on a mission to educate people about the importance of diversity and inclusion. We in this world, certainly in our nation, and even quite specifically in our educational environments and institutions, simply must get better at creating environments that are diverse with an inclusive culture. There's language that says, look, this is the right thing to do. There's a moral case for this. She spread her message in Hampton Roads as part of the Dean's Lecture Series at Old Dominion University's Batten College of Engineering and Technology. Colleges and universities cannot carry out their mission of preparing students to both make a good living and live a good life in the 21st century and beyond without diversity, diversity on the boards of trustees, diversity among the faculty, the staff, in the curriculum, among the students, and in interactions with the surrounding community. Her credentials are impressive, starting with being accepted to Fisk University when she was just 15 years old. I didn't want to go to a university at age 15. All I had to do was flunk the test. But I was so stupid, I didn't do that. I sat there and passed the test. It was a wonderfully important experience to go to Fisk University, to be in that environment of black intellectualism and focus on the visual arts. It was, it was a wonderful, wonderful experience for me. A renowned anthropologist, author, and educator, Dr. Cole received her PhD in anthropology from Northwestern University. After teaching at several colleges and universities, she went on to serve as president of both historically black colleges for women, Spelman and Bennett Colleges, 
and is the only person to have ever done so. Dr. Cole then served eight years as the director of the Smithsonian National Museum of African Art and is currently a consultant with Cook Ross, a firm that specializes in diversity training for corporations. She says the current techniques we've been using to bring about change aren't working. Just standing up, screaming at the straight white guys about how bad they are hasn't gotten us very far. Dr. Cole says once we can accept that we all have biases, we can begin to address something she refers to as unconscious bias. I asked Dr. Cole to share an example of the kind of change that can take place when unconscious bias is addressed. Orchestras in the United States for years had almost no women. You know what happened when auditions became blind. And then what we found out, that even though the numbers increased, something was still not going right until somebody realized that on uncarpeted floors, they could tell when a woman walked in to play her violin or her bassoon, the click, click, click of her heels. And so when a carpet was put down and those listening to the audition couldn't tell if it was a woman or not, and it was a brilliant performance, she got hired by the orchestra. Unconscious bias. For another view, I'm Lisa Godley. Dr. Johnetta Cole, she was just incredible last night, <laughs> and she speaks truth to power. Dr. Cole is currently a principal consultant with Cook Ross, where she works on initiatives relating to diversity, accessibility, equity, and inclusion in art museums. And I want to remind you again, if you would like to reach Joan Russell Turner to have her come out to speak to your organization about gangs and gang life, uh, the number is 757 8096 and the uh, name of the book that we were talking about today is No Colors 100 Ways to Stop Gangs from Taking Away Our Communities Bobby Kipper and Bud Ramey are the authors and you can go to solveviolence.com in order to uh, find out more information and to get uh, how to show you how to get involved so guess what? We're in search of a new pundit for our Another View Roundtable. We're looking for someone who identifies as a moderate Republican or independent. If you think you have what it takes to hang with the roundtable, please send me a resume and a short, no more than 500 words, paragraph on why you should be chosen. Please email this to contact at anotherviewradio.org. And please, 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 no phone calls. <laughs> and thanks to you, to those of you who have already applied, we will be in touch very soon. And that's our show for today. Remember, you can find our Another View podcast at anotherviewradio.org, iTunes, or any other place that you go for your listening pleasure. And please sign up for our eView newsletter. It's a once a week reminder of upcoming shows. Subscribe at anotherviewradio.org. Our theme music was composed and performed by Jay Sennett. Lisa Godley is our show producer. Victor Bowen is our audio engineer. And Jordan Yowell answered our phones. I'm Barbara Ham Lee. Thank you so very, very much for listening to Another View. <laughs>